welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. We've got a great science hub planned for us. So good evening, I'm Nancy Coddington. I'm the Director of Science Content at WSKG Public Media, and I'm also one of the co-founders of Science Pub Bing, along with two other dynamic ladies, and Christine. Hello, I'm Christine Keyswort. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm a freelance writer. I've been in the Binghamton area for two years. Um, and this is a really special Science Pub because our guest speaker tonight, Dr. Carrie Peterson is the one who introduced me to Science Pub in Virginia. And I liked it so much, I wanted to bring it here. And thanks to Nancy and Julie, we've managed to do that. Um, our other co-founder is Julie Weisberg. She is Communications Director at Family Planning of South Central New York. And she's working late tonight, so she can't join us. But thanks goes out to her, as always. Thank you. And with us tonight, we have Dr. Carrie Peterson joining us from Virginia. And so one of the great things about having these events virtually versus in person is that we do get to bring in guest speakers that are not from around this area. So thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Peterson. Yeah, thanks for having me. My pleasure. And while we're waiting for people to continue signing on, uh, everybody's probably just grabbing their links and getting signed into Zoom, or maybe they are grabbing their drinks. We'll just give them a couple more seconds before we get started. But the weather's finally turned nice and chilly here in upstate New York. Quite. We had our first snow in Richmond yesterday. Oh, you did? Yeah, it's already gone. <laughs> yeah. That's okay. what you want. So Christine, I remember that science pub we went to first, I was really interested in it because it was about scientific failure. I don't remember that one very well. Yeah, it was all about how all scientists have all sorts of failures and that stuff gets, doesn't get talked about as much. And how to, what we should do about the fact that we have all this knowledge and failure that doesn't get published. Yeah. It's still a problem. <laughs> yeah. Well, the one I remember most was about um, cadavers. <laughs> yeah, that one was good too. How that whole science came about, people donating their, their bodies to science. Fascinating. Mm -hmm. How should we do it? <laughs> oh, those sound like really good ones. Yeah, I agree. Um, we had a comment from Daryl that you do learn a lot from your failures. And I think, yeah, science is, that's one of the great things about science is you do learn so much from things that don't work as much as the things that do work. Right. Mm -hmm. Endless array of topics. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, we've got to watch that play out, right, over the last several months with the coronavirus and, and searching for that vaccination. You know, it's been interesting watching people, the public, respond to how science actually works. Yeah. So the first vaccine in the UK yesterday, right, or today? FDA approval. Uh, yeah. in, the, in the UK, they've already started, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah, and the importance of modeling. So I do a lot of modeling in my work. All fields of science do. Um, and so it was fun to see everybody jumping to models right away to see mm -hmm. how this was going to play out and how models can be wildly different from each other. <laughs> That's very true. <laughs> but are very useful as well. <laughs> Very true. And I think we see that a lot, right, with uh, meteorology. And oh, yeah. They yeah. do a pretty good job, honestly. <laughs> they, yes, they do. Yes, they do. Okay, so we are going to go ahead and get started. Thank you again so much for joining us this evening. We are recording this webinar so that we can share it with those who weren't able to make it this evening. Uh, but tonight we are going to learn how evolving science of brain stimulation from the use of ancient eels and catfish to treat pain to the high-tech implants being tested in spinal cord injury patients. Dr. Peterson's lab is working on several of these and we are going to learn what the future of rehabilitation and healing may hold. Uh, Dr. Peterson is the director of the Rehabilitation Engineering to Advance Ability Laboratory, the real lab at Virginia Commonwealth University. And Dr. Peterson has expertise in musculoskeletal biomechanics and neurorehabilitation. She oversees research, research designed to help patients with positive stroke 
hemiparesis and spinal cord injury. So welcome, Dr. Peterson. Thank you so much for being here with us this evening. Yeah, thanks for having me. And just to confirm, I'm now successfully sharing my screen. Yes, you are. Okay, fantastic. <laughs> Yeah, so thanks for that introduction. Um, I'm at uh, VCU here down in Richmond, Virginia, and I direct the Rehabilitation Engineering to Advance Ability Lab. And our acronym is the Real Lab. And I thought it was clever because VCU's logo uh, motto is to make it real. So some people like it, some people don't. Um, anyway, uh, let's advance this slide. Okay. So my research areas, I have two primary areas. Um, one is in neuroplasticity and neuromodulation. Um, under that realm, we evaluate things like spinal reflexes. Uh, we're interested in motor relearning after a neurologic injury. And we also use brain stimulation, which is primarily what I'm gonna talk about today. Um, I also do some research in the area of musculoskeletal biomechanics. Um, under that realm, I've studied walking mechanics in various populations and also the dynamics of upper limb activities. Uh, the human populations that we investigate are spinal cord injury, stroke, and we also study non-impaired um, individuals as control subjects. So what I'm gonna talk about today is brain stimulation as promised and advertised. Um, applications of that and also um, spinal cord injury rehabilitation because that is the primary focus of my research right now. Uh, so just to start with a little history of brain stimulation because it's pretty interesting I think. Uh, the earliest known forms of brain stimulation was live fish. Uh, so that was used by the ancient Greeks and Romans um, they observed that now catfish and electric rays could be used to treat body conditions, um, for example, headaches and other disorders. So this figure on the left is a catfish and we have got an electric ray and apparently they would apply the, the rays to foot conditions and the catfish to head ailments and they didn't quite know at that time that electrical activity was happening. They were just like, this seems to work, <laughs> let's do it. I will say that's also a lot of science today. <laughs> um, understanding mechanisms is harder than recognizing that something was working. So after the Greeks and Romans, uh, Galvani came along and in 1791, he discovered that electric electricity does flow through nerves. So that was a major finding. And then in the 1860s, during war times, um, physicians found out accidentally by irritating exposed brains on the battlefield that that resulted in twitches on the opposite side of the body. And hopefully you're aware that 80% of our neural fibers cross over at the level of our necks, which is why this side of the brain controls your opposite side of the body. So they realized that accidentally. And then in the 1900s, we had some real researchers um, who worked on anesthetized monkeys to outline the motor homunculus. So if you don't recall the motor homunculus, essentially it's a brain map. It reflects the density and size and distribution of neurons that are devoted to controlling our muscles in the body. So this figure here, the brain, we're looking at the motor cortex. Motor equals muscle coordination. And it's very organized in terms of the neurons and then the muscles that they ultimately descend the spinal cord and reach out to innervate. And so looking at this brain map, the face and the hand are really large in size because we have a lot of neurons devoted to controlling um, those parts of our body, and they're also very superficial. Um, whereas we don't have as many neurons controlling our toes, and you know that intuitively too, because you can do really fine motor control stuff with your hands. Um, and then luckily we don't 
have to do, well, we've adapted to not design things to do things with our toes because we don't have as fine a motor control of our toes. And you'll also want to remember this too because the, this brain map helps us realize what areas of the brain we should focus on um, in stimulating the brain. All right, so we've got the motor cortex and then, okay, and we also know electrical activity is involved with creating um, muscle contractions. Um, and then the first form of brain stimulation in the modern area was electroconvulsion therapy, which is essentially a procedure which in, uses small electrical currents that are passed through the brain to intentionally trigger a brief seizure. And that was designed to treat major depressive disorders and bipolar disorders. And then it kind of got a bad rap in the 70s um, per public perception. But today it's back, <laughs> but done better, um, performed under anesthesia, and it's still done. Um, the main limitation of this technique is skin and scalp resistance, which actually is what causes the pain. So non-invasive brain stimulation, but the limitation of it's painful. So transcranial magnetic stimulation is what I'll primarily talk about today. Um, that's major adva advancement over electroconvulsion therapy is that it's a non-painful, more focal form of brain stimulation. The history behind, well, I'll refer to it a lot as TMS because it's kind of, I don't really like saying transcranial magnetic stimulation over and over. So I'll refer, it's commonly referred to as TMS. Um, so some researchers in the 50s were fooling around with magnets and frogs, and that's where a lot of science starts. Um, and then it wasn't until 1985 that Barker and his colleagues developed the first transcranial magnetic stimulator that could be applied to humans. And today there's many forms and different applications of TMS, and I'll be talking about some of those. But this is our the picture of the dudes and the first TMS device. So how does TMS work? Well, it works through electromagnetic induction. If we have any physics teachers, high school physics teachers in this class, um, potentially you recall Faraday's law. <laughs> Not important for the context of this class, but um, or, or this talk. But essentially when you have an electric current that passes through a wire, for example, a coil, it creates a, mag a magnetic field. And then when we have an object that conducts electricity, for example, the brain, our brain conducts electricity, if that object passes through a magnetic field, then we get an electrical current that's created in the object for example, the brain. So TMS is inducing a magnetic field that generates an electrical current in the brain. So that's how it works. And what's in the brain? Well, it's essentially a bunch of neurons that generate and transmit electricity. So highly excitable. And then other than neurons, we have supporting cells in the brain that help the neurons function. So these are very beautiful images that we can now get of the brain. This is a technique called diffusion tensor imaging, where we can um, use MRI methods to look at uh, the diffusion of water molecules that can tell us about the neuroanatomy of neurons in the brain. So just a little background on how we can get these nice, lovely brain images. So neurons, so they are pretty complex. I think you probably know that as a reminder <laughs> of neurons, there's many and they send electrical signals down their axons, but then they communicate with other neurons through chemical interactions. So we've got neurotransmitters that get released that then tell the next neuron to either keep that signal going or not. 
It's really an all or nothing principle is actually what we call it. The all or nothing principle of the action potential. So got a bunch of neurons in the brain doing all this electrochemical action. And now it's time for a quick check in terms of how many neurons we think there are in the brain. So we've got a poll question ready. So the question for you is, how many neurons are in the brain on average? So your choices. Just launch the poll for everybody. So I don't know if you can see that, Dr. Peterson. I can see it. Okay. Yeah. So you know your options because you're reading the screen. But 50 million, 86 billion, 90 trillion. But there's also the option of unknown because we can't measure it very well. Almost everybody's voted. Oh, wow. And we've got an unequal distribution. <laughs> I like that. I just want, yeah. Essentially, the feedback is a lot. <laughs> I can end this and share our results. Thank you. All right, so the winner is the correct answer. Good job, y'all. Do I hit stop share results? I, I can do that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and then we've got several votes, though, for 90 trillion, also a good guess, and unknown. So the true answer is 86 billion. For the longest time, it was estimated at 100 billion, which turned out to be a really good estimate. Um, but we do now have staining techniques and also the diffusion tensor imaging that I just noted, where we can do a better job of counting neurons. And luckily, scientists are smart enough. No one's actually counted all the neurons in a brain yet. Thank goodness. I don't think we need to know the answer that badly. But they, what they do is count in a small section of the brain and then extrapolate out. So we can more or less measure that now. Progress at work. Okay. Um, in terms of brain stimulation technology, I've already talked about TMS. I'll be talking about TMS a little more. But we do have widespread use of um, other types of technologies as well. So an invasive form is deep brain stimulation. Um, that involves a procedure, a surgical procedure, where electrodes are actually implanted in certain brain areas, and then those electrodes um, generate electric compulses that control abnormal brain activity. Um, probably the most widespread application for that is for to treat Parkinson's disease or essential tremor. So we now have pretty great technology for implanting electrodes right on the brain and controlling that through a neuron st stimulator that's implanted in the body just like a pacemaker would be. So deep brain stimulation is our most common invasive um, type of brain stimulation. Non-invasive brain stimulation is gaining in popularity for obvious reasons, and it's also a lot easier to get research subjects to come participate in a non-invasive um, brain stimulation protocol. Uh, the two most popular are TMS, which I, you're familiar with now, and then also transcranial direct current stimulation. So that is shown here in this picture. It's it involves direct electrical currents to stimulate specific parts of the brain. So rather than indirect through a magnetic field, it's actually applying low um, frequency currents to the brain. And we can even deliver that in home-based therapy these days too. So that's a major advantage of TDCS. It's less focal and less potent than TMS, but the Main advantage is that it can, it's easier to administer. TMS is still more or less living in the um, clinical and research world so far. Okay. Um, 
believe. Did I miss a slide? No. Um, one thing I want to point out is that we are able to modulate the brain. We can either increase excitability or decrease excitability of um, neural output through brain stimulation. So you can imagine there's a wide range of applications. Um, I focus on the motor cortex, sometimes the sensory cortex in terms of touch perception, but you can apply these approaches to any area of the brain that needs modulating. So TMS was actually developed for depression. Um, so let's do another question. So you brain stimulation, again, is a technology where we want to modulate neural activity. And now I want to hear from you what you think is not a current application of brain stimulation technology. So we've got, again, not. So choices are athletic motor training, gender identity modulation, pediatric movement disorders, musical training, or cognitive enhancement. Again, I'm looking for what is not actually a use currently for brain stimulation technology. We got the votes coming in. They're coming in. And just to remind you that your vote is anonymous. So even if you don't know, go ahead and put your, go ahead and put an answer up there. And I think we're almost everybody voted. So I'm gonna end the poll and share our results. There we go. There's also no penalty for wrong answers. <laughs> it's just supposed to make this more engaging. And I think, thank you for participating in the polls. So good job, y'all. You got the answer again. Thankfully, the correct answer is gender identity um, modulation. Uh, identify. Okay, so I got a typo on my slide here. I did recently in preparing for this talk learned that it has been applied for changing sexual orientation, but to date has not and hopefully never will be applied to modulate gender identity. Anyway, but yes, uh, that's the correct answer. It has been used for athletic motor training, pediatric movement disorders, uh, musical training, and also cognitive enhancement. Okay, so TMS applications. It's been FDA approved for treatment of major depression. That was in 20 or 2008. And then it's also been approved for pain and certain migraines recently, more recently. It is approved for use as an investigational device for research, which is how labs like mine can operate. So TMS applied to the motor cortex can be used for motor training. Uh, this is a picture here of TMS in my lab. For example, we're, um, this was a study where we were assessing modulation of cortical motor excitability. So you can use it as a rehab tool or as a tool just to learn about how the nervous system adapts after a spinal cord injury. So one advantage of TMS applied to the motor cortex is we actually get a quantifiable output. So if you're targeting depression, Yes, there's definitely clinical questionnaires to gauge whether the therapy is working. Um, but as a scientist, I like numbers. <laughs> so the number that we're interested in when we use TMS is this motor of potential. So when we hold the coil of our, over a, a person's head, and we deliver a pulse that induces neurons to fire. And then we have a sensor located on the muscle. For example, if we were targeting the tibialis interior, so your muscle on the front of your calf, we would have a little, what we call an EMG sensor, electromyography, that captures that net signal that arrives at the muscle. 
in response to the TMS that we just applied. And so we use that EMG signal and look at it. That's all we do. And that's called the motor of a potential, and we just want to know how is that size changed <laughs> in response to you know, um, different therapies or different conditions. So it's actually pretty awesome in that we've got direct feedback of the stimulus that we just applied. Again, a benefit of applying TMS to the motor cortex over other areas of the brain where the feedback isn't as clear. Dr. Peterson, we have some questions. Can I interject with some of those? Yeah, go for it. Um, so, how does cognitive enhancement work? <laughs> uh, not my specialty, but the fact that we can stimulate the brain and say you want to focus on like maybe somebody has trouble with motor planning you can target that area of the brain deliver repetitive stimulation and observe whether it was useful or not also for example another benefit of tdcs right the non-invasive form that's pretty simple to deliver you can have you can determine whether it's working by having somebody perform some sort of cognitive task, I don't know, maybe do a puzzle, um, and then have them do that again while they're receiving stimulation and see if there's any change in output. Hopefully that answers your question. I've never myself studied brain stimulation in the context of cognitive enhancement, um, but Essentially, it's the same across the board as you're trying to either increase or decrease activity in a brain area and see if that results in a change in performance. So can it be used for um, musical training? Well, yeah, that would be the same idea. So the musical areas of your brain, if you stimulate that during, you know, like in this picture that I found, whoops. I want to go back, right? So TDCS delivered during musical training. There's studies that have reported improvements, but I would say a lot of, it's so preliminary in our understanding that for every study that you find where there's improvements, there tends to be a study that says, oh, we found no change. So <laughs> more or less, I would say for TDCS in general, this is the very easy to apply. Um, the jury's still out as to how effective it is. We do know it can modulate activity to some degree, but um, whether those changes are significant and long lasting is like a whole field of research what we're trying to figure out. Okay, great. I have a couple more questions. Um, okay. So I think this is hopping back a couple slides, but do you know uh, what they gleaned from the frogs and magnets? <laughs> they gleaned that you could, that was just preliminary testing of magnetic fields. And if you change the magnetic field, can that, stimulate a neuron. So as with a lot of science, we do we use animal models to test our theory first. So before I'm gonna hold this coil over a human brain <laughs> and change magnetic field and see what happens, I think I'll try it on a frog first. That's the idea. And oh, sorry, go ahead. And um so we still do that though. Like there's cutting edge research happening primarily in rats and cats um, because we can unfortunately use those animals in, I don't do animal research, but I definitely benefit from animal research because that informs the research that I do on human subjects. So we're gonna segue from that to, is this used on kids? <laughs> It is, yeah. So for the longest time it wasn't because nobody wanted to be that researcher to try it. 
Um, but I believe now, for, so kids unfortunately have neurological disorders too. And in the research world, I know that, um, I think they go as low as age five currently. So yes, TM TMS for pediatric movement disorders is, is a thing. The one, I think the, so the only weird <laughs> condition that hasn't been tested because nobody wants to go there, but there's no reason to believe that it's unsafe is pregnant women. Um, I guess there's not a large degree of pregnant women with neurological disorders that would benefit. So that's part of the reason it hasn't been studied. But strangely, on all our safety measures, we have to agree that we're not going to use this on pregnant women, more or less because just it's never been done. Someday somebody will do a study and it will probably be, the results will be, it's safe, <laughs> but not been done yet. All right. Any other questions before I? Yes. <laughs> this oh. is great. We have, um, how effective is this for Parkinson's? Very effective. <laughs> um, so that's a bad answer. Um, again, not my expertise, but the fact that it's been so widely used indicates to me that it's very effective. I've seen, I mean, I teach a rehabilitation engineering class and I like to show students a lot of videos and it's a I have, I'm recalling the specific one where they have the device off versus on. And essentially the person is stuck. They have like freezing of gait. Um, so the individual will be stuck, like not able to initiate walking at all. And then they turn the device on and the person can walk. So ideally I had a backup slide with that video, <laughs> but that is not prepared. So yeah. Um, deep brain stimulation is effective enough that it's FDA approved and routinely done. Great. Thank you. We have more questions, but I think we could keep moving on because we can ask them as we go. Okay. Or we, okay. So here we are, we're talking about TMS and then, so since the days of TMS being discovered, there's obviously been a lot of advancements. Um, this figure on the left shows what we call neuronavigated TMS. So rather than somebody holding the coil, we can now have robots that hold the coil. The robots are connected to a computer that has an MRI image of the person. So it can actually use detailed information about that specific person's brain and use the robot arm to place the coil exactly where the stimulation should be applied. So that is about as fancy as it gets in terms of TMS devices currently. Um, there's been a whole field of coil design, of course. In the middle of the screen, I have a figure that's articulating what closed looped brain stimulation is. Closed loop means that you're delivering stimulation in response to the current brain state. So what I've described so far is just you hold a coil, you deliver stimulation. That's just like one way. There's one input and you get an output. But the efficiency or efficacy of brain stimulation depends on the current brain state. That's something we've learned over time through research. So we can now use brain recordings, which can be, be done with EEG non-invasively. You have electrical recordings from the brain and then you, you use that information to know when to trigger um, the TMS. So that's what closed loop brain um, TMS is. And then I've got this picture here of a rat with a TMS coil as a thank you to all the rats who have been involved in TMS advancements. Basically anything we do in humans is first tested on rats. And for example, this, this rat, they've got 
those wires coming out from the rat are sensors that are put on forearm muscles. So this study was looking at targeting the motor cortex in a rat and observing how that signal um, was delivered to uh, flexor muscles in the forearms. All right, so in summary about TMS, it can be used to both measure cortical motor excitability, which is excitability of the motor cortex to the muscle. And we can also use it in a repetitive form to manipulate or change um, the excitability of that pathway. So next I'm gonna talk about applications to spinal cord injury. But we'll first have a reminder of the spinal cord. So the, the unique nature of the spinal cord is that it's also highly organized. And this figure shows the innervation of muscles at different levels of the spinal cord. So looking at the top, the cervical spinal cord, I mean, it's organized in a very intuitive manner where at the cervical level, those neurons then project to um, your arm muscles. And then as you go lower in the spinal cord, that's where chest muscles, abdominal muscles are innervated. And then in the lumbar region, those nerves control leg muscles. Okay, so that's a reminder of how our spinal cord is organized, which is important for understanding then the deficits that are lost after an injury. So after a cervical spinal cord injury, let's say you had an injury at the C6 level, that means that all the functions listed below are, are lost or impaired, depending on whether it was a complete injury or perhaps you had an incomplete injury. But unfortunately, that's how spinal cord injury works. So the spinal cord, let's do another question to gauge our knowledge of the spinal cord. This is a true or false statement. True or false, the spinal cord can initiate movements by itself without the brain. And remember you are voting anonymous, so. Yes. Just go ahead and vote. I like that we get representation in all the answers. <laughs> I like that it's really split. Yeah, this is a tight one. It's kind of like the election we just had. <laughs> huh. Okay. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad I asked. I wasn't, I wasn't quite sure how much people knew about the spinal cord. Um, all right, it's, oh, we got 50-50 split. This is very entertaining to me. Um, I mean, I study the spinal cord, so I happen to know the answer, but I suspected that people wouldn't know for sure, and that I guess I was right. Uh, the answer is true. So we have reflexes, which means a reflex is a situation where your muscle or nerve, it just, you get a stimulus. Say I get a stimulus on my hand. Or my reflex is where that stimulus travels through my nerves to my spinal cord and then just goes right back to act. That's what a reflex is. So that happens without the brain knowing about it, the brain finds out about 100 milliseconds later. <laughs> it's like, oh, <laughs> um, yes. So the spinal cord can initiate movements by itself without the brain being involved. It's much faster because it doesn't have to involve the brain. The brain. Um, and also there's a whole field of research about training the spinal cord um, after neurological injury. We can train the brain, and so there's a field that's focused on can we train the spinal cord. Um, 
the short answer so far to that is we are very successful in training um, rat spines, but that has not translated very well to human spines, but it's a, it's a whole field of research. All right, so back to spinal cord injury. Uh, we saw the spinal cord. A cervical spinal cord injury is at the top level, and unfortunately that results in tetraplegia. So that's impaired function in all four limbs, hence tetra or quadriplegia. They're two terms for the same thing. And unfortunately, that's the most frequent level of injury. And it results in impaired function of the upper limb, in addition to um, complete paralysis below the level of injury. But the upper limbs are really important for self-care tasks especially when you're in a wheelchair. So it's the most desired outcome of rehabilitation uh, to improve upper limb function. That is primarily the focus of my current work. Um, the options right now for improving upper limb function after cervical spinal cord injury are kind of divided into two areas. So Clinically and also in the home, physical therapy can happen in those spaces. Um, there's assistive devices and also upper limb reconstruction, which is, I should have changed that to surgery. That's a fancy way of saying surgeries that you, where you can actually transfer either a muscle or a nerve to do a new function. So those are options in the clinic and home. And then the lab, so research labs, are where we're exploring kind of fancier new technologies, um, like what we refer to as neurotechnologies, like brain-computer interfaces, where there's communication between somebody's brain and, and then using, with a spinal cord injury, there's changes in the brain's function, but the problem isn't the brain, the problem is the transmission of that signal. So brain-computer interfaces are meant to capture the brain's intent and then perhaps use some sort of robot or some or prosthetic to perform that function. Um, also, lab-based research is neuromodulation, which is just a huge, that involves stimulating at various levels of the nervous system, and brain stimulation is one example of that. So in my lab, I'm finally getting to the part where I'll talk a little bit about the type of research we've got going on right now. Um, we evaluate surgical outcomes. So these surgeries that transfer muscles, um, there's multiple surgeries that can be done and we've done some work where we actually compare the surgeries to see, for example, how much elbow strength is um, restored. So this picture here is we've got this like fancy we call it a elbow moment transducer that can measure strength um, quantitatively versus um, in the clinic they actually just have a person a highly trained professional rate but we wanted to do a more sensitive comparison so we we used an actual force sensor what else do we have going on so I also collaborate with the biomagnetics lab here at VCU. They happen to be in mechanical engineering. I met this guy who designs TMS coils. That was a good find. Um, and so we've got a project now where we're using imaging data where we can get information about actual neurons in the brain, import that into computational models, and model the effect of TMS, which has, hopefully you can understand how models are very useful because you can do things to a model that you can't do to a human subject. That's a major advantage. And you can also do things a lot faster. If we only could learn by bringing people into our lab and holding a coil over their heads, research would be very slow. But we can model things, we can model stimulus parameters, 
um, a huge variety of things and learn a lot more from a model. So that's something we do, but we do also um, apply what we've learned and see, does that actually translate to humans? So we do use repetitive TMS paradigms. That's a picture in my lab. You might be wondering what that person is watching. <laughs> that person is watching a nature video because we try and control for cogni cognition um, while we're delivering the therapy. And so somebody did a study where they found that nature videos were the had the lowest impact on like excitement levels. So basically all TMS studies now use uh, nature videos to just like control cognition and keep the person awake. Um, so another application that we're exploring in my lab is pairing neuromodulation with actual physical therapy. So what this looks like is we deliver TMS for about 20 to 30 minutes. Immediately after that, the person participates in therapy where they're ideally in this heightened um, cortical state. And then we see, does that improve motor function? So that's the types of studies that we're running right now. Another study that we are starting in February. We got funding for this over the summer. Um, I've got a collaborator who's really interested in virtual reality interventions, which is perfect for me. So my friend Zena, <laughs> she's, the, she's a professor in physical medicine and rehab. She developed this VR intervention for individuals with spinal cord injury. And so far that they, they found that there's no improvements over conventional therapy. So she's trying to, you know, you can adapt the virtual world and make it better, but also there's evidence to suggest that brain stimulation before the intervention improves outcomes. So that's primarily been shown in stroke patients. So we are now applying this to individuals with spinal cord injury. We are seeing whether that increases touch perception and for this, we're using TDCS because we are delivering this to people's homes. So the advantage is they don't have to come in clearly to the clinic and receive the therapy. They're more likely to do it at home. It's, more, it's a more long-term solution. And also, you know, there's situations where you have to stay home. <laughs> that's something we've all learned this year. So um, that's another project. And then neural navigation is very expensive. So we've come up with ways of um, delivering low cost neural navigation. So just more like basic motion tracking that can be done with like a Microsoft Connect um, in a much cheaper form of tracking the TMS coil in space relative to, you know, the uh, $100,000 systems that exist. Okay, this is great. Timing is working out. I've got one more question. Hopefully you'll participate. The last question is, which species recover best after an equivalent spinal cord injury? By this, I'm referring to if you have a monkey, if you have a rat and a human, let's say they all have a C6 level injury that's complete, a complete injury. Which species is going to recover the best after that spinal cord injury? This is a tricky question. I don't really know why I would think you would know the answer. <laughs> I would probably even ask my grad students and they may or may not, hopefully they know the answer. Yeah, this is one where I was going, hmm, I can't wait to see what the answer is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, get your last vote in there if you haven't voted already. It's just fun to participate. All right. Yeah. Thank I you. Like participation. I'm going to go ahead and
end the poll and share our results. Awesome. Okay, so of my questions, you guys got three correct. Um, this one, yes, rat is correct. Um, sadly, we don't know exactly why that is yet, but what we've learned is we've, there's been a lot of research where spinal cord injuries are induced in rats because you can really control the injury and then observe um, what happens. And rats, rat nerves sprout and regenerate a great deal and brain stimulation like further enhances that so if you only went by the rat literature you would think that spinal cord injury is like just a minor problem these days but unfortunately what we've learned especially over the last 20 years is that human neurons don't regenerate nearly as well and that's um that's a major challenge in our field is that we've learned a lot from rats but oh crap that doesn't translate to humans so good job y'all knew that um so yeah that was my last question and i felt like a good message to end on after talking about the um the nervous system is to be safe uh wear a helmet wear a seat belt um, unfortunately, vehicle crashes are the number one cause of spinal cord injuries and just wear a mask. So with that, I just wanted to thanks, thank everybody for listening and thank my research team and my collaborators. And I'm happy to take any questions that you have. Okay, we've got lots of good questions. Um, so do you know why with the rats, why the rats seem to be a little more resilient there? <laughs> well, yeah, that's one thing we're trying to figure out. We have observed that rats can regenerate nerves way beyond the capacity of humans. Um, I mean, they they're smaller, they've got less nerves to regenerate. That could be a factor. But I would say the best answer in the field yet is we don't know. But we would sure wish humans could regenerate nerves as well. Um, one thing I was thinking about this week as I was watching, uh, what was the, My Octopus Teacher? Have you, is that a documentary everybody's seen now? Okay, well, the gist of it is, at one point, the octopus is, loses an entire arm, and the arm grows back. And that was just a reminder of species are wildly different, and other species are way better at regenerating themselves than we are, right? So that's, we are good at some things, but we are not good about, at regenerating our bodies. We got to work on this, humans. Let's do it. <laughs> Well, that's a good rally call. <laughs> yeah. Come on. Let's um, we do have a couple of questions that we'd like to dive into. Um, and before we do, though, I do want to address, uh, Carol had asked if there will be a recording. Yes, this will be, that we are recording this. And um, we do do a small edit and put some closed caption on it. So then it goes out probably by the end of the week or early next week. Um, so please do ask your questions in the chat. We are going to get to them. I'm going to jump onto a little backlog we have. Um, can you talk about what is TDCS? Okay, so TDCS is um, basically you've got electrodes on, on the head and they're connected to a stimulation device where you directly apply electrical currents and so that current passes from one electrode to the other. And in doing so, you are able to generate an electric current near the neurons. And so it's best suited, it's not as focal or as able to stimulate as deep as other techniques, but it can be useful in some applications. Okay, thank you. And how focused can you make magnetic fields? Yeah, um, so depth and how focal 
is an ongoing question. Right now, we use these what we call double cone coils, and they can go about five centimeters deep, pretty focally, and within about, we can target with accuracy of about one millimeter. And in terms of like what gets stimulated, the truth is that everything gets stimulated a little bit, but with coil design, we can at least target the hotspot to, for example, a, a finger muscle. We can target specific arm muscles. When it comes to the leg, just based on the design of the motor cortex, it's a lot trickier to target specific muscles in the leg. So definitely some design challenges out there if you're into designing magnetic coils. <laughs> I'm just going to take us right down to why is it that legs but not arms can become paralyzed but not vice versa? Okay, so let's go back. I'm still sharing my screen. So yeah. we're going to look at the spinal cord again. So motor control starts with the brain in terms of volitional motor control. So involuntary is a reflex, but things that we mean and intend to do start with our brain. So if you've got an injury at the top, that means the brain generates a signal and it's going to stop once it reaches the injury. And so in that case, everything below that level is not re getting that electrical signal. So, but I think that is a good question because you might be thinking, okay, so you can't get voluntary brain input, but can you still get the reflex input? And the answer is yes, because that's still an intact neural system below the level of injury. It's just not getting the information from the brain like it normally would. So hopefully that answers the question. Thank you. So if nerves are severed, such as in zone six flexor tendon injury, would TMS be helpful? Well, that's exactly what we're trying to find out. <laughs> um, there's, an, there's evidence to suggest that it is helpful because it can do two things. It can help train what we refer to as residual pathways. So it can enhance pathways that are still intact. And there's also evidence to suggest that it can improve the function of um, pathways that are impaired to some degree. So I can't give you a yes or no answer. I can say that's exactly what research is trying to, um, we're trying to answer that. Um, the answer is going to be tricky. It's gonna be to something to the flavor of, well, it depends on your age. <laughs> it depends on your exact injury. Um, depends on what type of training that you received in the acute stage. So there's differences between acute and chronic spinal cord injury. Um, so the answer is not yes or no, but potentially. <laughs> that's so unsatisfying, but that's what research is, is trying to learn more about um, neurological disorders so we can uh, better design rehabilitation. So do, do these stimulation techniques have any use for spine damage due to arthritis? Right, so yes. The more minimal the, the injury seems to be um, more responsive to brain stimulation therapies. So in other words, brain stimulation isn't going to, in fact, we've, kind of, we've stopped testing this in people with complete injuries because we've learned there's no way you're gonna, if it's a complete severed injury, we can't bypass that. Um, but if it's a minimally damaged pathway, that's where it seems to work the best. 
So, you know, talking about that, that staying right on that thread, um, can this study phantom live experiences? Yes. So phantom limb pain is an application in modulating um, sensory pathways. Certainly. Mm -hmm. Do you have any recommendations for sciatic nerve? Sometimes the nerve in legs go numb. I, I'm not, a, I'm not gonna, uh, no, I don't. Okay, how does all of this relate to a lie detector testing? <laughs> oh man. Oh geez, I, that is not a question I'm prepared for. <laughs> Honestly, I don't even know how lie detectors work. That, what do they do? Does anybody know how a lie detector works? Well, it's probably, let's see. I don't know enough about lie detectors to answer this. I'll make a note. <laughs> Figure out how lie detectors work. This will be a good follow-up. Maybe we can post that on our, um, our Science Club Bing Facebook page. Yeah, I do have a, I do have a uh, feeling that lie detectors can be improved by our advances in technology in terms of recording and changing brain signals. But, okay, that's a whole nother talk is like <laughs> lie detectors. Maybe that's for a future one. And Rachel mentions, yeah, they measure part of your heart rate and compare it to a baseline, but yeah, they're also measuring, measuring other things, right? Comparing that to a baseline. Yeah, okay. Steve, put that on our list. Well, how do lie detectors work? <laughs> <laughs> um, can this be used to stimulate spinal cord to bypass the brain? Oh, so now I like this question. So transpinal stimulation is when you, you can either apply a change in magnetic field directly to the spinal cord with the same principle as holding it over the head. So you can generate electric currents in the spinal cord, which would also generate, um, you know, excite. We have neurons that live in the spinal cord too. So definitely that's an exciting field of research right now is applying stimulation directly to the spinal cord. That can be done invasively or non-invasively. So I'm actually working on a study at the VA hospital right now uh, with Dr. Gorgi, where we're implanting um, stimulators in the spinal cord itself, not us, but the neurosurgeons. Um, and they undergo exoskeleton walking therapy in combination with stimuli delivered right to the spinal cord through implants and seeing if that improves walking ability. So I should have talked about that. And we're comparing that to a group that's receiving the non-invasive um, spinal cord stimulation. So yes, that's a great question, certainly. How successful is TMS for depression? What are your thoughts about rapid TMS and depression and anxiety? Okay, well, I'm going to rely on the FDA because what the FDA does and look, is they look at the data to say, is this approach better than conventional therapy? And the fact that it was FDA approved means that there's data to suggest this treats depression well above the risks of the treatment. So, and it's also quite extensively used. So it's kind of similar to my question about ITBS in um, Parkinson's disease. Or it's widely used and it's FDA approved. So that means it's very effective. They wouldn't approve it if it wasn't. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, is anyone doing this TMS hand flexor tendon injury research around Berkeley, California? <laughs> Seven year olds. <laughs> um, well, where is that in California? The answer is likely yes. Um, if it's near a major city, the answer is yes. 
TMS research is so widespread for any major public university, there's somebody there doing TMS research. All right, how often are invasive brain stimulation operations performed and what are they treating? This is invasive brain stimulation? Yes. I don't know the prevalence numbers. Um, the primary treatments are for Parkinson's disease, essential tremor. Um, it has to, they're most effective for uh, neurological disorders that have trouble initiating movements. So movement is so complicated that the motor cortex isn't the only thing controlling it. There's also the premotor cortex. There's specific areas of the brain that are deeper that can control balance and also like initiating and planning movement. So that's why we have to use deep brain stimulation and implant directly on those neurons that we can't reach with other methods. Um, so preval I don't know the prevalence, but those are the treatments. Great, thank you. Um, what would be a huge home run in your career research, research or academic life? Something you'd love to see in your, in your lifetime? Oh, done by me or somebody else? Oh, 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 oh. <laughs> okay. Um, that's a great question. For me, I mean, it's kind of hard to, I don't want to answer this for myself because as a research, it's really like a team effort. Um, you want the whole field to progress, essentially. You're just doing your little piece of the puzzle and nothing, I, I don't know. We see small improvements and that has a huge um, impact on somebody's life, um, especially in tetraplegia, right? They're not asking for full function of everything. They just want to use their arms better. So for me, I do like seeing individual improvement and positive outcomes of something that I've helped develop. So I get, yeah, that's my answer <laughs> for myself. And in the field of, let's say, spinal cord injury rehabilitation, I think that if we could figure out how to grow or regenerate neurons, that'd be fantastic. Um, they're the most, the closest we are, are groups in Switzerland where they, they basically do multimodal rehabilitation where they're combining like chemical interfaces, stimulation techniques, and also physical therapy. Um, so basically multimodal approaches are looking like what we have to have, which is why myself and other types of researchers know we have to combine our therapy with something else. It's not just a standalone, like, oh, just stimulate your brain. No, that's gotta be combined with some other therapy. So the evidence that we can regenerate nerves would be a home run for um, the field of spinal cord injury for sure. Yeah, that would be huge. Mm -hmm. the possibilities would be. In humans, we can do it in rats, but it'd be nice to be able to do in humans. <laughs> do, do rats have more DNA? Is that what it is? No, I need to learn more about this. <laughs> Why can there's probably some review paper that goes into it in detail? Um, yeah, this is great. If you have any last questions, pop those into the Q and A or into the chat. Um, we did have a question: if slides will be available? Yeah, I can share my slides with you all, and you can do with it what you will. Thank you. And there will be a recording of this because that will get sent out and is available on uh, WSKG. You can watch it on your smart TV or you can watch it online or on our YouTube. And as people are thinking about their last thoughts, if they have another question, um, go ahead and sign up for our next Science Cup, which is January 12th. It's next year already, which is 
exciting news to put 2020 to bed, but you know, not much is really going to change in January. I'm sorry. <laughs> Be the bearer of that. However, we are going to have a great science pub on January 12th at 7 p.m. The link is in the chat. And it is going to be on the art of science, which is really cool. Um, you think about all of the scientific information that's shared with you, but this is going to be talking about how you actually take some of that data and put it into either an infograph or in a way that's easy to understand. And we have doctors Erson and Bolt that will be sharing their information on that. So it's going to be a really, a really exciting science hub. So please RSVP. And I want to thank Dr. Carrie Peterson. Thank you so much for your time and expertise tonight. This was really fascinating. and really enjoyed learning about brain stimulation. Yeah, thank you. I had a good time as well. And thank you, Christine Kieswer, uh, Julie Weisberg. I'd like to thank WSKG Public Media. And thank you so much for attending tonight's Science Pub. And if you liked what you heard tonight, please make sure that you like our Facebook page, Science Pub Bing for future events and science updates. And you can also find us on WSKG as well. So thank you so much for joining us this evening. And we hope you have a great holiday season and the end of 2020. Thank you. Good night.